It's a film made from 700 hours of raw footage. It's an art project of unhaired proportions. Dao, directed by Ilya Khrazhanovsky, set out to be a biopic of the Soviet physicist Lev Landau and a denunciation of Soviet totalitarianism. The project, which is being rolled out this year, saw cameras follow 300 everyday Russians around a set built to replicate life in a Soviet city. In 2009, over 400 people left their everyday lives to go back in time to the Soviet Union. For over two years, they lived and worked at the Secret Research Institute. Even before Dao was premiered in Paris this week, reports of the size and the scale and the ambition of the project had amazed and unsettled. Joining us on the line from London is Albina Kovalyova, who worked on the project at various stages. Albina, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. First of all, it's it's been called it's been called a film, it's been called an art project. As someone who worked on Dao, can you describe exactly what it is? Sure. I mean, I think it might be helpful to differentiate the different stages of it because initially it was a, a film project, or so it was understood to be. There was a script, although that script seemed to be quite closely guarded and was hidden. It was written by uh, the famous Russian author Sorokin, Vladimir Sorokin. Um, But, you know, initially when I started in 2006 as a casting assistant, it was very much like, we're going to make this film, we're going to need to cast some, you know, huge amount of ordinary people in order to make it look authentic. But then, having left in 2007, Mm. what I heard in the 10 years that I wasn't working the project, that it is that it morphed into something really beyond uh, a film. It was, uh, they created this set in East Ukraine, in Kharkiv, where people lived, um, ordinary people lived kind of day-to-day lives, scientists, uh, real scientists were there, doing work in labs or research or conferences. And it became more of a kind of observation of life in a, set in a very unusual setting in a kind of semi-recreation of the Soviet Union, but also with a very kind of artistic taste take on it. It wasn't a complete replica of the Soviet Union, although they did go through the times. They, they would change certain Uh, power dynamics and stylistic things, you know, as you went from 1938 to 1968, which is when it ended. And all of this over the course of uh, two years. So it was, uh, this institute was destroyed in 2011. But then afterwards, you see, since uh, 2012 in post-production, what you kind of learn when you when you work on it and especially now when you encounter this project is that to think of it as a film experience is not helpful at all because even the films that you watch are kind of anti-filmic they're drawn out and boring and they don't necessarily have a plot line uh in in the traditional sense but what I think is more helpful is to see this as a as a kind of recreated world. And that is everything from the set that they created in Kharkov to the post-production um, studio to, I suppose, um, even the launch in Paris. You, you mentioned that you worked as a as a casting assistant. Can you tell us what it was like to to be to be looking for people to to participate uh, in in the project? What sorts of people were were you looking for? And did they have a clear sense of what they were signing on to? It was very vague. The, my assignment was just to go and find people, you know, that would look authentic uh, in the setting of the Soviet Union. So I went through all of Moscow's museums, you know, just taking photographs of, you know, the people who were, who were working there, the staff. I went to loads of university faculties. I went to the circus. I think I even went to an orphanage at some point. And what I was doing is I was just taking photographs of people and trying to persuade them to let me do that because Moscow is quite a hostile place in that sense. You know, especially this is like the early 2000s. People were still really suspicious of the media having, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff going on in the 90s. And uh, even just persuading them to take a photograph and give me their number was hard enough Hmm. because they're like, what film? I don't want to be in the film. What are you doing? Who are you? It was all very suspicious to them. But so I just, you know, I worked on this huge database of uh, non-acting people, just headshot and then the profile of that person and their name and title and uh, their Mm -hmm. phone number. 
and that was it. And it was, but it was just, you know, kind of never ending. I had to cast so many different institutions and it wasn't clear, you know, how they were going to be cast or what was going to happen to them. I mean, it did seem bizarre. It would make you wonder what sort of, uh, what sort of budget a project like this had. This is, I suppose, the focus of a lot of, um, speculation, you know, where is the money coming from? There is a an official answer, which is apart from the film funds, the various European film funds that have given uh, money towards the project, there is um, an official backer uh, who is a Russian oligarch, Sergei Adonyev. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, there is an official answer for this. The question is, why would he back this um, very unusual and almost never-ending project? In a piece that you wrote for The Telegraph, you said that having been in proximity to this project, you'd been left with a bad feeling. You had been left uh, troubled. Can you explain why that is? Well, I mean, I would go further. I mean, I would say that I was really affected by this in a deep way, Um I, since I sort of started working on it again in 2016, I spoke to, um, you know, 50, over 50, closer to 60 of the participants. And I did interviews with them from, you know, one to two hours with each of them. And sometimes I do multiple interviews with, um, with some individual. And I saw, I don't know how many hours of the footage, but, you know, probably close to 100 hours, maybe, maybe not so much, but anyway, a lot. And I saw the different kind of things that were captured. And I did feel like some of it had really crossed the line of what is permissible. Um, it is complicated because you see, you are, you are told that, well, people who were there were aware of um, that the rules were flexible and that sort of unpleasant things could happen to them, including uh, violence and interrogation and sort of psychological pressure. So they agreed to it. But um, even if that is the case, I think there's still a way that people were um, influenced in that environment that would make them act in ways that they probably would never have um, acted in normal life. And although the project sort of embraces that and says, well, that is the place where they can act in these sort of uh, ways. It's liberating in that sense. I think that in some cases it wasn't liberating, but the opposite. I'm not saying that in some cases it wasn't liberating. I think for some people it was a kind of freedom that they could act in in ways there that they, they'd feel um, too restricted to in, in life. But I think in some cases, uh, the dark side of people came out, or they would become victims of someone else's dark side. And the other side of this whole thing is that, okay, if you've got adults who are consenting to being in this situation, whether you know they're subject to great pleasure or abuse or whatever it is, um, you've got the other side of those beings, sentient beings that don't have a choice. And those are animals, and those are children and those are people who might have mental um, illnesses or instabilities. And I think that given that they, there were these vulnerable groups involved, I think that that is really unfair. Um, and that raises a lot of moral questions to me as a, as a journalist, but also as a human being. There's one scene that, uh, that I described in the article, which is... Um, the, they have babies in uh, with Down syndrome who they placed in cages and then they took them out and performed kind of pseudo experiences uh, experiments on them. The Dow team told me that these babies were treated well and that they had their cares with them and um, that really it was my sensitivity as a as a young mother that I w I'm reacting like this to this scene. But of course, these babies were orphans. Uh, and I felt that, you know, who can really speak for orphans in East Ukraine? And even if the orphanage gave a blessing to to use them in such a way, I felt like it was, uh, I mean, something in there is wrong in my uh, intuitive understanding of things. And so then, then I was really troubled by this and, and, and the way that people kind of... Um, explained it away and said that it was actually okay. And it was a kind of normalizing of what I thought was really a terrible thing to do. So at this point, um, 
you know, I had to leave the project because it was just emotionally really difficult to be in this environment and to be sort of convinced that I was wrong about something that I felt really intuitively that I was right about, if that makes sense to you. The project was launched in, in, in Paris. Uh, it's been written about in a slew of Western news organizations. What kind of impact have you seen it have in Russia? Are viewers here likely to appreciate it or see it as a denunciation of Soviet-era rule? Mm, I think, really, it's difficult to, to answer this question. I think there's been a lot of mixed reviews. If we're going to just focus on the Russian um, reaction, then it's interesting uh, as a contrast to the Western uh, reviews, which a lot of which have been pretty critical. I haven't really seen many critical official Russian reviews. They really talk about the kind of artistic... Uh, integrity of this project and how unusual it is to recreate this and the kind of depths of detail. And of course, this is a Russian project originally, but um, yet it seems it will never be shown in Russia because there's so many things in it that would make it, well, impossible to to, uh, be shown in a country with ever-increasing censorship laws. Uh, I mean, for once, there is a film about a gay love story, which is very graphic. That that would never be shown in Russia, of course. What does it say to you that um, the the Soviet Union is thought of as being a time of extreme censorship, and now that this critique of the of of that era is being is being produced, now it it sounds as if you're saying that it's unlikely that it would be shown in in contemporary Russia. What does that say to you about the the, the media landscape, the cultural landscape here in Russia at the moment? Well, I don't think that the reason that it won't be allowed in Russia has to do with the fact that it's a critique of the Soviet Union. I think the reason it wouldn't be shown in Russia is because it has all of these elements that would probably be deemed illegal in Russia. Um, But I think also to look at it as a critique of the Soviet Union uh, is to simplify it a bit, because it certainly does look deeply into what how certain elements of the Soviet Union worked, like power, for example, because you've got the kind of KGB operators there and how they used, what kind of tactics they used and how people would respond to that and how people might betray their friends. And, um, and of course, visually, it was very much like being in the Soviet Union. But I think it's not really necessarily about that. I think it's about recreating a world. It could be the Soviet Union. It could be another world. It doesn't, I don't think it's, um, it, it matters so much, but I think what, what it becomes is sort of a study of power. How do you put in, put a group of people together and control them? And what if you loosen the control here? And what if you apply pressure here? What happens? What happens if you change the power structure and make it more free? And then what happens if you bring in a new group of people and uh, make a kind of, I suppose, brutal ending? You know, so I think it's really playing with with different uh, groups of um, influence. And it's really a kind of social experiment, I would say, rather than a recreation of the Soviet Union. I think really that's where, you know, a lot of people make um, the mistake of thinking it really is about the Soviet Union, this project. I don't think it is. I think by just influencing people in this way and, and creating this Soviet atmosphere, but then applying things that really had nothing to do with the Soviet Union and, and, and using modern people as well, you just get something completely different. I'll tell you one thing that I found in this project, which is very much linked to present day Russia. And that is this idea that you see nothing really is true. So you can have any sort of version of truth. And that is, of course, the Russian tactic for fake news and, you know, post-truth world. You know, what is, uh, what is the truth anyway? Is it not a matter of perspective. So maybe this event happened like this, or maybe this event happened like this. Albina, thanks very much. Thanks for taking the time to to speak with us. All right, take care. Bye. (laughs) 